morning church what a privilege we have to be in the house of the lord you know all over the world church doors are closed but heaven does not close its door on us we have an opportunity this morning to engage with our father in heaven and to do business with him in a moment our worship leaders are coming up and they're going to lead us in worship and i just want to encourage every family wherever you are to engage in worship stand to your feet raise your hands sing along as we worship our father who is in heaven this morning amen and amen
what a time we just had in worship. And thank you to all our worship leaders for leading us so well. And I believe you have prepared your heart to receive the word of God this morning. In a moment, Dr. Makoni is coming up to deliver the word that the Lord has prepared for us. And I believe that there is a word for each and every one of us. But before he comes, I just want to invite Pastor Nyasha, who is going to come and lead us in a prayer. Let's agree with her in prayer this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning, church. You know, the word of God encourages us to pray for those who are in authority, to pray for our leaders. In 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1, it says it pleases God to see his children, to see his church intercede for those who are in authority. And this morning, I shall lead you in prayer for our leaders in this nation. Father, we thank you and we glorify your name. We thank you for our leaders. Father, we thank you for our president. We thank you for the teams that are working tirelessly with him to come up with decisions that will affect our families, that will affect our children. Father, we come before your throne and we say, Lord, we pray for divine wisdom, a divine calmness, a divine direction that comes from you, Father. We thank you, Lord Jehovah God, that you will give them the ability to make decisions that are well prayed out, that are well thought out. In your name, Father, we thank you, Lord Jehovah God, for protection, protection for their families as they work tirelessly to make decisions, to come up with ways and strategies that will help this nation as a whole during this season. Father, we also want to pray for perseverance, perseverance for all the teams, for the people that are working in the National Council. Father, we pray in the name of Jesus that the Spirit of God is there to lead them, to direct them. Father, we also pray, Father God, that some of them are at the brink of losing their jobs. But Father, we pray for divine perseverance, that Jehovah God use each and every one of them, Lord, to continuously work and to be able, Lord Jehovah God, to be led by your Spirit. Father, lastly, we pray pray that let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Father, we pray for your will to be done. Have your way in this season for our nation. Have your way in this season for our families. Father God, we look up unto the authorities that you have set us uh, said for us in this season and father we pray lord jehovah god that they are being led by you we pray that jehovah god you are in full control of everything that is happening of every decision of every strategy of every policy that is going to be set in this season and we glorify and honor your name in jesus name we pray amen be blessed We thank God for the wonderful worship experience we have just had, and we move on in worshiping Him as we receive the Word of God. But as we do, let's start by praying. Father, we thank you for your Word. We thank you for who you are. We worship and we glorify your name. Father, we come before your presence. We submit ourselves to the authority of your Word for who you are. We ask you to speak to us in the name of Jesus and minister to who we are, minister to where we are at and encourage us, strengthen us, heal us, minister to us by the power of your word. We thank you, Father, that your word is sharper than any two-edged sword. It's active and alive in our lives right now. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Church, we spent the last eight sessions talking about the Abrahamic blessing and that we are the seed of Abraham and God has blessed us in Abraham. I want to continue and build on by shifting gears and begin to talk about the basis of the Abrahamic blessing. Where does the Abrahamic blessing come from? What is the anger? What is the source of it? What strengthens, what makes it powerful in our lives? And that is rooted in the Abrahamic covenant or the blood covenant. So I want us to begin to lay a foundation of the blood covenant in the next number of sessions. So today my, my role is to just uh, lay the basics of the blood covenant. And I want to put some propositions to you that I want you to consider as we dig deeper into this. So to, I want you to understand at the very beginning from the outset that the cornerstone of our relationship with God is established on the foundation of an irrevocable, unbreakable blood covenant that God made first with Abraham, our father, the father of faith, and then he ratified it in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we need to understand that covenant because it establishes our relationship with God. It makes us understand how God relates with us. So to kickstart, I want us to start in Galatians chapter 3, verses 15 to 18. Galatians 3, verses 15 to 18. And I read, Brethren, I speak in the manner of men. This is Paul arguing. 
Though it is only a man's covenant, yet it is, if it is confirmed, no one annuls or amends it. So once the covenant is done, it cannot be annulled, it cannot be amended. So he says, now to Abraham and his seed were the promise made. He does not say it into seeds as of many, but as of one. Uh, and to the seed who is Christ. And this I say, that the law which was 430 years later cannot annul the covenant that was confirmed by God in Christ Jesus, that it should make the promise of no effect. For if the inheritance is of law, it is no longer promise. But God gave it to Abraham by promise. I want you to see something in that text. It says that once a covenant has been made and it has been ratified, it has been established, it cannot be added to, it cannot be revoked, it cannot be annulled, it cannot be amended. Then it goes on to talk about Abraham, God talking to Abraham and establishing this covenant of promise with Abraham and his seed. And he says that seed is Christ. Then what I want you to focus on is where it says that this covenant cannot be annulled by the law because it was confirmed by God in Christ Jesus. So think about this. What God is saying is that the Abrahamic covenant was confirmed by God in Christ Jesus before the law was, which means that God was had already established this covenant through Christ Jesus, although Abraham was the human vehicle in terms of what was happening here on earth. Then it says, but God gave it to Abraham by promise. So we can clearly see the link between that irrevocable, unchangeable covenant with Christ Jesus. So it's not really the Abrahamic covenant, but it's really the New Testament covenant we are talking about. So we go on and we find that in Psalms 89 verse 34, it talks about the inviolability of this covenant. The fact that this covenant cannot be violated, cannot be broken, cannot be changed. So God says, as he's speaking to David, he says, I will not break or violate my covenant nor change the thing that has gone out of my lips. So he says, I've made a covenant, I've made a promise to you, and I cannot change it. It cannot be annulled, it cannot be amended. So the Mosaic law cannot change the, the covenant. No law can change that covenant because it was confirmed in Christ Jesus well before the law. Then we find again in Deuteronomy 7, verse 9, Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 9, the Bible says this, Therefore know that the Lord your God, He is God, the faithful God who keeps covenant and mercy, with them that love him and keep his commandments to a thousand generations. So we see the faithfulness of God being proclaimed that this is a covenant to which God is faithful. God is a covenant God and he keeps his covenant. Now, if we back back to Abraham in Genesis 15 verse 18, we see that when God enters into a covenant with Abraham in verse 18 says, on the same day, the Lord made a covenant with Abraham saying to your descendants, I have given this land from the river of Egypt to the great river, the river Euphrates. What I want to draw your attention to is when it says I'm, the Lord made a covenant or he cut a covenant, the Hebrew phrase for cut a covenant or make a covenant is karath berith, karath berith, to cut a covenant. So God cut a covenant and that covenant is established in Christ. So this is what I want to do. I want us to walk through some propositions as we lay a foundation, begin to lay a foundation of our study in terms of covenant. So proposition number one is the definition of blood covenant. You see, blood covenant is an irreversible, lifelong relational commitment that overrides all other considerations, bringing two persons together as one for a common purpose and for their mutual benefit and mutual welfare. That defines the nature and the terms of the relationship and sets for the principles of commitment to it. Let me break it down. So the blood covenant which God entered into with Abraham, which he also ended, which was ratified in Christ Jesus before the law and confirmed on the cross, is an irreversible, it's a lifelong relational commitment. So it's a covenant that establishes a relationship. It's lifelong and it's irreversible, it's irrevocable. It overrides all other considerations. In other words, the covenant, once you have a covenant, the covenant becomes the constitution, the governing a document of the relationship between God and man. So that's why we need to understand covenant because it's the governing document that determines what we do. If we were a trust, for example, as an organization, it would be the deed of trust that determines what we do or a memoranda of incorporation that determines what we do. And it binds two persons is one in other words a covenant speaks to unity speaks to oneness it speaks to one accord and this is for a common purpose this is for mutual welfare 
And this covenant, by its very nature, it defines the nature and the terms of the relationship. So if you want to know the nature and the terms of your relationship with God, you need to go back to the covenant. And it also sends for principles of commitment or loyalty to that covenant. So we see that the Abrahamic covenant is already in Christ Jesus. Remember Galatians 3 verses 7 and 29. The Bible says, Therefore know that only those who are of faith are the sons of Abraham. And verse 29 says, And if you are in Christ, then you are Abraham's seed, and heirs according to the promise. So clearly we see how God has wrapped all the people who are in Christ into the Abrahamic covenant. And so the Abrahamic covenant speaks to us as believers where we are at. And I want you to understand that this is an eternal blood covenant that everybody that who is in Christ Jesus is heir to. And so everything that God promised to Abraham, we become heir to. That's why the Abrahamic blessings, the Abrahamic promises were critical because they are really our inheritance in Christ Jesus. That's who we are in Christ Jesus. So number one, proposition number one is the definition of the blood covenant, which we have just covered. Number two, I want you to understand that every blessing from God is based on his covenant promises. So every blessing that we have, the Abrahamic blessing, the blessings of healing, the prosperity of well-being, every blessing comes from is based on the covenant promises because God is a covenant keeping God. So what we can say is that a covenant is the foundation from which every promise in the Bible depends. So it's the foundation, it's the undergirding, it's the strength of every promise that God has made in the Bible. But a covenant is also, number two, a channel through which those blessings flow to us. So through covenant, those promises flow to us. And number three, it is the reason why God's blessings flow to us. So a covenant is a foundation for which the promise for every promise in the Bible. It is a channel through which every blessing flows to us. And it is the reason why God's blessings flow into our lives. That's why we need to, um, to understand that covenant. Every blessing from God is based upon his covenant promises. So to live in the reality of God's blessings, it is very important, it is imperative that we understand the depth and the breadth of God's covenants. And this is what we are going to be surfacing, this is what we are going to be studying, this is what we will be going into in the next few weeks. So proposition number three, is that God's promises are secured by the covenant. So we saw already that God's blessings are based upon his covenant with men, which is principally the Abrahamic covenant, which was ratified in Christ. So we also see that those promises are anchored in the covenant realities, and they are guaranteed by that covenant. So the covenant is the guarantee of the blessings of God. So the reason I can come to God and I can pray about a certain blessing, it is because it's guaranteed by covenant. We see in Hebrews 6 verses 12 to 16, it says when God made a promise to Abraham when he entered into covenant with Abraham, because he could swear by no one greater, he swore by himself, saying surely uh, in blessing I will bless you, in multiplying I will multiply you. I want you to understand that when people entered into a covenant, they swore allegiance to the covenant, they swore commitment they to guarantee that covenant, they swore by their gods, they invoked their gods. So what the scripture here is saying that when God entered into covenant with Abraham and later ratified it in Christ, God could not swear by a God because there is no God above him. So that's why he swore by himself because there was no one greater than him. So he himself through covenant is the guarantee of every promise that he has made to Abraham and to us. And so it says of Abraham, so after he had patiently endured, he obtained the promise. For men indeed swear by the greater and an oath for confirmation is for them an end of all dispute. So if you want to think about it, we are saying every promise that God has ever made to you, every blessing that you have staked to, it is confirmed by the covenant. So the covenant is the guarantee of that promise. Verse 17 to 20 of Hebrews 6 continues to say, Thus God determining to show more abundantly to the heirs of the promise. We are heirs of the promise. The promise is the blessing of Abraham. They are our inheritance. The blessings of Christ are our inheritance. So God wanted to show more abundantly and to convince us the heirs of the promise. The immutability of his cancer or his covenant. He confirmed it by an oath. So God wanted to show the unchangeableness, the inviolability of his covenant. So he confirmed it by an oath when he says, surely by myself, I swear. So it goes on to say that by two immutable, unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we might have a strong consolation. We have fled to, for refuge to lay hold of the hope that is set before us. This hope we have is an anger for the soul, 
both sure and steadfast, which enters the presence behind the veil, where the forerunner has entered for us, even Jesus, having become the high priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. So let me unpack this a little bit. So we said that the covenant is really the guarantee of the promises of God, is the guarantee of the Abrahamic blessings, is the guarantee of the promises of who we are in Christ, is the guarantee of our inheritance in Christ. So it says God was so determined that through two unchangeable things, which two unchangeable things? Number one, the covenant itself, that is the promise. Number two, by the author that he made, by those two unchangeable things, in which it is impossible for God to lie, that God made assurance and he guaranteed, and he did that through Jesus Christ, who is our high priest. So you can see the link between the Abrahamic covenant and God's blessing in Christ. And Jesus Christ is the mediator of that covenant, is the high priest, is Melchizedek, who is our high priest. So we see that every blessing of God is guaranteed by covenant. So when I come before God in prayer, I am coming because I have a guarantee, I have an assurance, I have a confidence, and that thing stabilizes my soul. It's the anchor for my soul because it is anchored in the covenant of a God who is not a covenant breaker, a God who keeps covenant, a God who is true to his word. So proposition number four, let's move on. Every interaction between God and man is based on covenant. So God's dealings with us are based on covenant. That is why it is important for you as a believer to fully appreciate the calling of God and the purposes of God as they are revealed within the Abrahamic covenant. Because covenant is central to everything that God does. Because like we said, every promise that God has made, it comes from his covenant. So for example, our salvation originates from God's covenant of promises. Even the assurance that once you are born again, once you are a child of God, that you will spend eternity with Jesus. It comes from the covenant. So our new identity, our position in Christ, the very fact that we are in Christ Jesus, these are covenant realities. These are covenant blessings. We are in Christ because of covenant. So our ability to stand before God in prayer with boldness. Remember the Bible says, let us therefore come boldly before the throne of grace. What gives us that boldness? It is covenant because we are coming in the name of Jesus. We are not coming in who we are. We are not coming in our strength. We are coming on the basis of Jesus. So we are invoking covenant. The thing that gives me confidence when I pray before God is not my righteousness, but it is covenant because God's dealings with me are based on the covenant that he made with Christ Jesus. Listen to C.H. Spurgeon, the, that mighty preacher of, of years gone by. He says, all God's dealings with men have had a covenant character. He says, it has, pleased, it has so pleased God to arrange it that way, that he will not deal with us except through a covenant. Nor can we deal with him except in a covenant. So we our dealings with God and his dealings with us are governed by covenant. They are within covenant. That's why it is important for us to understand the, the covenant because covenant governs our every relationship with God and our every dealing, our every transaction with God. It is so important, vitally important for a believer to be grounded in new covenant realities as they are found in the Abrahamic, in the Abrahamic covenant and ratified in Christ Jesus. So number five, Proposition number five. Today we are just laying the foundation, but through propositional statements. So proposition number five, or principle number five, truth number five, is that a covenant is a pledge or a promise. So you see, a covenant itself is a mighty promise to us which we can hold fast to. So a covenant really provides a clear statement of God's purposes, God's intentions, as they are expressed in in that covenant, and that they bind God by a solemn oath to perform those promises. So a covenant reveals the intentions of God, reveals the purposes of God, reveals the will of God. So as we learn to hold on to the covenant, we will live increasingly in the fullness of our blessings, in our, of our inheritance in Christ. So that's why it is important for us to understand covenant. So Hebrews 8 verses 6 to 9, the Bible says this, Hebrews 8 verses 6 to 9. But now, he who has obtained a more excellent ministry, by so much he is also the mediator of a better covenant. Jesus is the mediator of a better covenant, which was built on better promises. For if that first covenant, which means the Mosaic covenant, had been without fault, then no place would have been sought for the second covenant, which is the Abrahamic or the covenant in Christ Jesus, the new covenant. For finding fault with them, he said, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, and I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers the day I took hold of their hand and led them out of Egypt. 
because they did not continue in my covenant, and I did not regard them, says the Lord. Verses 10 to 13 of Hebrews 8. He says, For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws into their mind, and I will write them in their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. So he says, this covenant is no longer driven by external laws, but I am writing my laws inside you. you. My word is going to be in you. The terms of the covenant will be in you. And he says, and I will write it in your hearts, and I will be your God, and you shall be my people. Then goes on, and they shall not each man teach his neighbor, and each man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for all shall know me from the least to the greatest. In other words, we will be taught of God. The knowledge of God is inside us, and God is teaching us. And he goes on to say, For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness, and their sins and their iniquities I will remember no more. In that he says, A new covenant, ye has made the first old. Now that which decays and becomes old is ready to vanish away. So we see that Jesus is the, uh, the mediator of the new covenant. And the new covenant is a promise and a pledge built on new and better promises. So the blood covenant is really a pledge. It's a pledge of life, of resources, of blessings on the part of covenant partners. You see, this is an unqualified uh, commitment to each other. So and failure to live up to the commitments of that covenant meant death. How? Because the blood covenant binds in two ways. Number one, it binds in the sense that it says, I will, somebody is swearing and making an oath just like God says when he says, by myself I swear. In saying, I will keep this agreement even if it kills me. But we know God cannot die. We know God is life. God is everlasting. Therefore, because he cannot die, that's why the covenant is an eternal pledge. Number two, you say in covenant, if I break this covenant, you can kill me. But because God will never break his covenant, so we cannot even think about that. Listen to Andrew Murray. Andrew Murray, and this is what he says, Blessed is the man who truly knows God as his God, who knows that the covenant promises, or he knows what the covenant promises him. What unwavering confidence of expectation it secures that all his covenant terms will be fulfilled to him. What a claim and hold it gives him on the covenant keeping God himself. In other words, because it's a pledge, he's saying that when you know God, you have a confidence, you have an assurance of what God has promised. But not only that, he says, the covenant actually gives you a hold and a claim on God. In other words, I can come before God and say, my God, you said, you promised, you are obligated because you promised in covenant. So I have a claim on God based on what he has promised because God will not lie. So covenant is a pledge or a promise. So when we look at the Abraham, blessing we actually see it as an outgrowth as an out manifestation of the covenant because the covenant is in itself a pledge principle number six or prophecy number six you see a covenant obligates the partners to the terms of that covenant I say it again a covenant is an obligation it obligates the partners to the uh, to the terms of the covenant so covenant gives us the legal right and permission to draw from our covenant partner and demand him to come to our aid when we are in need. So you see, the thing about it, I am married to my wife in a marriage covenant. So because of that, my wife does not, he has a legal right to make a claim on the resources that I own. I also have a legal right to put a demand on the resources that she has. So it's, it's not even like a onerous, it's just like, I mean, it's almost like she can wake up and say, oh, by the way, can I have the bank card? Why? Because I am obligated by covenant. I can't say this is my money, this is mine, these are my resources. You can't touch them because covenant does not allow that. Covenant obligates me. So similarly, covenant obligates God to keep his promises and to come to our aid whenever we need him. So Andrew Murray said again, so the covenant was above all to give men a hold upon God. Is the covenant keeping God. So we have a hold upon God, just like my wife is a hold on me because of the marriage covenant. So that covenant gives me a hold on God and on his promises, and I can come and say, Lord, you, you, this is what you said. So I hold on to it. As a matter of fact, let me, let me put it this way. A covenant allows you to place a demand on your covenant partner. Just like if you have an agreement with a partner, you, if you can make a demand on your partner to perform according to the terms of the contract. Do you understand that when the Bible says, whatever you ask in my name, or you say, ask and you will receive, the Greek word zitiste, the Greek word used there is actually demand. He says, well, demand whatever you will, and I will give it to you in my name. What is he saying? He is using the language of covenant. He is not saying, can you beg? And many believers, when we come before God, we, we when on concerning 
concerning things that he has promised. We actually beg, but we don't understand that God says, concerning my promises, remind me, make a demand on me, because I have a covenant, I am obligated by covenant to come to you. In the same way that there are things that when God comes and calls for your life, he makes a demand, he doesn't negotiate, because you are obligated by covenant to yield your life to him, and to obey him, and to follow him. So a covenant gives each covenant partner a hold upon the other, permitting each partner to draw freely from the resources, the strengths, and the abilities of the partner. So when I deal in life, I know that I have a partner who has all the resources, who has all the gold, who has all the strength, who has all the fighting capability. So whenever I'm faced with challenges, I can draw on that by making a demand on God the Father in the name of Jesus Christ. I'm not making a demand because he is obligated to me, but he is obligated to himself. He is obligated to his covenant. He is obligated to his word. God is faithful to his word and to his covenant. So that is what gives me a hold on God. So you see, a covenant is built on an ability and a commitment to make and keep promises. And God is a promise-keeping God. He will not lie. He will not change. He is God who keeps his promise. So that's proposition number six, that a covenant creates an obligation. The moment I enter into an agreement with you, that agreement creates obligations from me, creates obligations from you, and obligations from me. So that is what covenant does. So proposition number seven. Hallelujah. Are we together? Do you, do you, do you follow with me? So a blood covenant or the Abrahamic covenant creates a relationship. The very nature, remember we said that by definition, a covenant is an irrevocable and irreversible uh, commitment to a relationship. It's a relational commitment. So the moment you enter into a covenant, you are creating a relationship. When I entered into a covenant with my wife, I created a relationship with husband and wife. When I enter into a relationship with God, I create into a covenant with God, I create a relationship. So the relationship that is created is the relationship of us coming into Christ. How do I enter into a covenant with God? I'm not going to cut, to cut blood. I'm not going to cut myself and shed blood because that was already done. All I need is to be in Christ. When I come to believe on Jesus and I call on his name and I become in Christ, I enter into that relationship. Now, the depth of a covenant relationship by its very nature breeds intimacy. Now, intimacy always bears with it or brings with it vulnerability. So the reason we have a covenant is, is that we have to protect that vulnerability. So there must be a commitment that goes with that intimacy. In other words, as Keith Intrata said, he says, to every degree of intimacy, there must be a corresponding degree of commitment. If God is intimate with me, is so friendly, is so relational with me, we have to protect the bond of that relationship with covenant. That's what a covenant does. A covenant is a commitment that holds me committed not to abuse the relationship. So a covenant or relationship is the highest form of relationship that can ever be. In other words, it's a priority relationship. The moment I enter into a covenant with God, it means my relationship with God is priority. It's the, you remember we said that a covenant by itself is a, is a relationship that, is, that overrides every other consideration. So when I am dealing in life, I know that I am obligated to God. I have a relationship with God. So that relationship with God says that my priority number one in life is God. How do I deal with God? How do I relate with God? When I put my priorities upon my relationships, my, my dealings, God always comes first. That's why the Bible says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Because God is first. By covenant, he has that demand on me. That he is first. Hallelujah. So, similarly, when I got married and I entered into a marriage relationship, you see, that relationship by virtue of that covenant, my wife is now first. She has a priority over my brother, priority over my father, priority over my sister, priority over every other relationship. Because the, the blood covenant is the top priority relationship. Now, you know, the Bible talks about a blood brother who is closer than a natural brother. Because it's a priority relationship. As a matter of fact, some people say blood is thicker than milk. What are they saying? They're saying, I'm related to my brother by blood, but in covenantal terms, we are related because we sat from the same breast. It's milk. It's a milk relationship. But when we enter into Christ, that relationship with Christ is priority. 
That's why Proverbs 18, 24, talking of a relationship that was created when we entered into covenant. So when we enter into covenant, you are not just brothers, you are friends. So in Proverbs 18, 24, it says, there is a friend that sticks closer than a brother. It's talking the language of covenant. When the Bible calls Abraham a friend of God, it's because of that relationship. So that relationship is intense that is created by a blood covenant. So the purpose of covenant is to ensure faithfulness and commitment to the relationships because these are, are important to God. A covenant, like we said, guarantees the relationship. Like we said, we enter into that covenant relationship with God by being born again, by being in Christ. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, whoever is in Christ, all things have become new for him. Because when you come into Christ, all things become new and you start a new relationship with God. So that's what Proposition number seven says, say, covenant by definition creates a relationship. Hallelujah. Proposition number eight. Covenant does not only create relationships, but it creates responsibilities. The moment I enter into a covenant, it imposes responsibilities on me. I have a responsibility to the covenant because covenant is about taking responsibility rather than demanding privileges. So many people, they, come, they get into marriage and they say, I want mine, I want mine, I want mine. But they don't realize that getting into that covenant relationship is really a demand is made on you to be responsible. So covenant imposes responsibilities upon you. You see, it is only the immature that demand their privileges and their rights. And the mature are the ones who assume responsibility. As a matter of fact, Dr. Edwin Lewis Cole taught us that maturity does not come with age, but it comes by assuming responsibility. So we understand that covenant imposes responsibilities. It imposes responsibilities to me as a believer to walk in a way that honors God. We spoke last week about how our name can affect his name. So I have a responsibility to maintain his name. So my shame should, kiddush, our shame should sanctify his name. Name. Because by covenant, I have a responsibility to make sure that his name is glorified, his name is honored. So every responsibility, by the way, creates also accountability. So covenant creates responsibility. So I'm responsible to God. But if I'm responsible to God, I'm going to be accountable to him. In the same way that I'm responsible to my wife to walk in purity, to walk in holiness, and to, to walk in a way, in a manner that he keeps your name honorable. So that means I'm accountable to it. So when we have that covenant relationship with God, we see that it creates a responsibility and an accountability. So we are accountable to God. We are accountable to the responsibility. We are accountable to the way we walk because of the power of covenant. So let's move on. Proposition number nine. Covenant demands oneness. It creates and it demands oneness. It demands unity. You see, when I am in Christ... I am one with him. Well, Abraham was now one with God. Wherever Abraham went, people associated and they would say the, uh, the God of Abraham and the Abraham of God because of that oneness. First Corinthians 6, 16b to 17 says this. It says, for he says, the two shall become one flesh. That's marriage covenant. But, but he's using it in a spiritual sense. He's talking about our relationship with Christ. It says the two shall become one flesh. It says, but the one who joins himself to the Lord is one spirit with him. Because I have entered into a relationship, into a covenant relationship with Christ. I am one with him. I have to be in one accord. I have to be aligned to him. I have to walk in oneness. That's why he is the head and we are the body. So there is a oneness between Christ and his body because of covenant. So covenant creates a oneness. So in Christ means we are inseparable from him. Do you remember the Bible says that, that what can separate us from the love of God? What can separate us from God? Because we have that oneness. We have that relationship. Covenant and imposes on us that we have to see ourselves as one with Christ, in Christ. So because of covenant, I have to train myself to view myself in Christ as one with him. Because that's what the enemy sees. You see, when I come before the devil and I'm, I'm, I'm doing spiritual warfare, he doesn't see me. He sees Christ because I am hidden in Christ. Because of covenant, I am in Christ. So, But here's the problem with many believers. They are clothed in Christ. The devil sees Christ when he is coming. And so when I'm going to confront the devil, the believer now, instead of just being one with Christ and walking in Christ and having that consciousness, they remove the righteousness of Christ. And that there's a devil, fear not, it's just me. Yay, yeah, it's just me. Instead of realizing that it's not you, it's Christ. So when you deal with the enemy, 
you deal him with that position, that position of knowing that I am one with Christ. The devil sees Christ. The same way when I come before God, I don't come as Makoni. I come as one who is in Christ. That's why he gave me the authority in covenant to come in the name of Christ because we are one. So covenant creates a oneness that we have in Christ. Number 10, covenant was cut on the basis of need. It was cut on the basis of weakness. In covenant, strength flows from the one who is from one who is strong to the one who is weak. So God, we are weak. I am human. I am frail. I have challenges. But when I come to covenant, the power of God, the strength of God, the resources of God flow from His strength to me, and it strengthens me. So covenant is meant to embolden one who is weak. So the stronger chief would have a covenant with a weaker one, so that he would become the protector. So we as humans, we were weak in ourselves. We couldn't confront the enemy. So we sought refuge in Christ. And we entered into a covenant with God so that when we walk in with Christ, we cannot be defeated by the enemy. So covenant was cut on the basis of need. Proposition number 11, and we are getting ready to close. Covenant is a revelation. You see, since covenant speaks to the terms of the covenant, terms speaks to how we relate with God, it is really a revelation. And Maurice Cerullo said this. He said, God is a God of purpose, plan, design, and objectivity. Therefore, God's covenant with men is a revelation, an unfolding of God's purpose, a revealing of his divine will for those who have covenanted with him. So when you enter into a covenant, God reveals himself through covenant. So covenant by its very self is a revelation. So you need to have your eyes open so that you may see the depth of the revelation of God in Christ. It's a revelation of the terms of the covenant and of the will of God in Christ. So think about this. When you have a consciousness of that revelation, you begin to walk straight. You begin to walk with confidence. Think about the relationship between David and Jonathan. They entered into a covenant. And the covenant was such that with the seed of Jonathan would be, far, would be seen with oneness with Jonathan. So when David said, is there anyone of the household of Saul who is still alive. He was thinking covenant. He was thinking of Jonathan. And then he was told, oh, there is Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan. And when jo Mephibosheth was brought, although he was uh, uh, disabled, although he was uh, uh, somebody who wasn't worth anything, David treated him as if it was Jonathan because of that oneness. He saw the oneness. And then Mephibosheth had to retrain his mind to see himself as one in covenant. And because of that, he would sit at David's table as a nobility, not as a dog as he had characterized himself. But many people, they don't understand that relationship, that revelation. So they come before God and they treat themselves as nobodies when they don't realize that we are nobility because of who we are in Christ. So the final proposition, proposition number 12, is that the covenant is for your good. The intention of the covenant is the good of the partners. You see, covenant creates an expectation of goodwill in the partners. Remember Jeremiah 29, 11? Really, this is language of covenant. He says, for I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans for welfare, not for calamity, to give you a future and a hope. So covenant speaks welfare. It speaks future. It speaks destiny. It speaks hope because covenant is for my good. But let me take it further. Jeremiah 32, 38 to 41 says this. They shall be, Jeremiah 32, 38 to 41, they shall be my people and I'll be their God. Then I'll give them one heart and one way that they may fear me forever for the good of them and their children, that they, for the good of them and for their children. And I will cut an everlasting covenant with them that I will not turn away from them to do them good. So God is saying, this covenant is now nah, I am going to do you good. Whatever is going to happen in life, I am for your good. So God does not mean ill. He has no ill thoughts, he has no ill plans, he has no ill machinations for you. He, the, he swore by covenant that he will do you good. He says, but I will put my fear in their hearts and they shall not depart from me. Yes, I will rejoice over them to do them good. And I'll assuredly plant them in this land with all my heart, with all my also. See how many times he says, I'll do them good. Because covenant is a purpose of doing good to your covenant partner. Ezekiel 37, 26 to 27 says, And I'll cut a covenant of peace with them. It shall be an everlasting covenant with them. 
and I will bless them and I will multiply them. And I will set my sanctuary in the, their midst forever. And my tabernacle shall be with them. Yea, I will be their God and they shall be my people. So covenant says God's presence, God's glory, God's tabernacle, God's sanctuary is going to dwell among us. Do you remember Revelation says this clause says, behold the tabernacle of God is with man. It's a covenant of peace. So God is always with us. He's Jehovah Shammah. He's the Lord who never leaves us, never forsakes us. That's what covenant does. So those are the 12 propositions I wanted to leave with you this morning as we lay the foundation of why it's important for us to get to understand covenant. Now C.H. Spurgeon speaks of the saints delighting in covenant. He speaks this way. I mean, he impresses me the way he puts it. He says the saints contemplate on the antiquity of that covenant, on the eternality of that covenant. They remember the sureness of that covenant. They delight to celebrate the covenant in their songs of praise. They delight to think of its immutability, its inviolability, and its unchangeability. They, they love to ponder on its inviolability, which is as old as eternity, as everlasting as the rock of ages. They rejoice to feast upon the fullness of this covenant its comprehensiveness because within it they everything they need is wrapped up in that covenant so we, we we think about it we ponder we meditate on it and they say and they contemplate on the graciousness of this covenant because this covenant is a covenant of grace God has been gracious to us. He has extended it to us, not because we deserve it, not because we are worthy of it. So that is the blood covenant, which is the anchor of the Abrahamic blessings. So I want us to, to, to begin to, as I close, I want to summarize this and say, covenant establishes relationships, our relationship with God. In covenant, we have covenant blessings. We have covenant commitment. We have covenant relationships. And we have covenant responsibility. And that covenant provides an anger for the soul to hold on to God and on to his promise. So that is covenant. So we'll move on the following weeks as we walk through the steps of making the covenant so that we fully understand the power of covenant. So I want to pray for you. Right now I want to pray for everyone who has a need. It may be a need for healing, a need for salvation, a need for deliverance, a need for provision. I want to pray and call upon God to say, Lord, you are obligated because you said in covenant you'd meet the needs of your people. And we want to call on God to show himself up. We want to place a demand on the covenant so that God will release the resources of heaven to meet your need. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray for your people. I call on your name and I declare in the name of Jesus on the basis of covenant, that irrevocable covenant, that covenant you said you would not break. I call on you right now and I ask you to come and show yourself, manifest yourself, meet your people at their point of need. Your strength would flow to our weakness. Your strength would flow towards our need. Father, heal the sick, meet the financial needs, break through, give breakthrough to those who need it. We heal families. Father, I declare in the name of Jesus, the provision of Christ. I declare the strength of God. Father, give victory in battle. Whatever battles your people are fighting, whatever people who are going through, even if there's mental challenges, I speak the peace of God. I declare the covenant of God. We invoke the covenant. God, you said you'd never leave us. You said you'd never leave us. You said you'd never forsake us. You said you'd do us good. So I call on you right now. Do good to your people. I call on the covenant, which you cannot break. Show yourself. Show yourself. Father, do good to your people. Give them a hope and a future in the name of Jesus. We declare it. We declare that healing. We declare that wholeness. We declare that deliverance. We declare that prosperity. We declare that victory in battle. We declare that peace of mind because of the covenant. Father, you made a covenant. You cannot break it. You have assured us that you will keep your covenant in the name of Jesus. We thank you, Lord, and we give you praise in the name above every name. Now, as we close, I wanted to speak to somebody who has not given their life to Christ. You don't understand the power of a relationship with God. Jesus went to the cross for your sake. He died on that cross. He says, this blood is the new covenant that I've made for you, for the remission of your sins. If you call on Jesus, the blood that he shed on Calvary's hill, that blood will usher you into wholeness. We will have your sins forgiven you. So I want to pray with you. If you want to have a relationship with God, and know that when you die, you go to heaven. 
All you need is to call on Jesus and enter into that covenant. So pray with me, if you will. Wherever you are at the sound of my voice, if you are to enter into the strength of this relationship with God, say, Father God, I call on you today in the name of Jesus. I've heard about the covenant. I want to enter into that covenant relationship with you. I want to be in Christ. I want my sins forgiven me. I want to be a child of God. So I call on you. Initiate me into this covenant. I believe that Jesus came, became man, died on the cross, paid for my sins, that I may be reconciled with God. So I call on that Jesus who rose again on the third day, who is Lord of Lords. Come into my heart. Forgive my sins. Make me a child of God. Father, I thank you for hearing me, for making me a child of God. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. If you prayed that prayer, I want you to know that God has heard you. You have entered into a covenant. And we want to walk with you to help you understand the depth of that relationship. So just type within this stream and just say, I prayed that prayer. If you are watching this well after the, the live broadcast, I want you to get into our inbox and just say, I prayed that prayer. And we will get in touch with you and we will help you. Thank you so much. God bless you. May you continue to walk in covenant in Jesus' name. Amen. What a powerful word uh, we have received this morning from Doc. Thank you, Doc, for such a word. Now, church, we have been encouraged and we have been challenged at the same time. Now it's time for us to engage with the word of God this week. Meditate upon it, pray it as we have been taught, and we will realize the power that is in the word of God. Now we have come to the end of our service, but before we go, just a few reminders. Yes, we are isolating. Yes, we are social distancing. But this is not the time to isolate ourselves from our church family. This week, connect with your soul family. Connect with our other brothers and sisters in the Lord. And stay encouraged. Not in fear. Hallelujah. And now, we have got an array of programs that are happening during the course of the week. And to receive notifications on these programs, please join our WhatsApp group, Pause at 107. And if you are not part of this group, please reach out to any one of our pastors or inbox the administrator of this Facebook page and you will be added onto this platform. Now, before you go, allow me to, to declare this word on us all. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Peace that transcends all understanding even under these circumstances. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Until we meet again next week, bye-bye.